So my name is Rustin Burlow. Um, I was born in Wisconsin, went to medical school in New York at Columbia, did two years in neurosurgery and then switched to psychiatry. In psychiatry, I did a residency at UCSD and then a two-year fellowship in mood disorders. Have been doing uh, brain stimulation for quite a long time and doing workshops to introduce other doctors to it also because there's great joy in seeing patients get better who have not gotten better yet. And that's really why we're all here. We're here to help people get better. We're here to reduce suffering. So that's who I am. So how many people here are psychiatrists? Okay, how many people here work for psychiatrists? Okay, how many people here have done TMS? Quite a few. How many people own your own system already? Quite a few. How many people own cloud TMS systems? Almost everybody. <laughs> well, how do you like that? I'm really glad I'm getting to know you. Um, okay. How many people are here because they're thinking about buying a TMS system? Good. How many people are here because they want to know more about TMS because they're doing it and they hunger and crave for knowledge? <laughs> I will fill your hearts with joy and gladness. <laughs> Partly due to the enthusiastic, charismatic, and inspiring nature of my personality. <laughs> okay, so you're an interesting group. So the title of it is How to Build and Start a Successful TMS Practice. Other people will talk about the business aspects of it. Don't ask me about billing. Don't ask me about reimbursement. The only thing I'm going to say about the business aspect of it is I had planned to uh, pay for my first TMS machine. I've got six now. I planned to pay for my first one over a six-month period. I kind of calculated it would take that long. It paid for itself in three months, and I wasn't even trying. So you'll find that it goes better than you think it will be going. But when it, when it comes to successful, what I'm talking about and what I'm completely focused on is how can we get the maximum number of people better and reduce suffering using TMS and doing it in a way, if it doesn't work at first, doing it in a way that is personalized and more effective. So if there are 15% of people that get no benefit from TMS, I want to find out who those are, predict them in advance. I want to find out what we can do differently to help those 15%. If there's 30% of people who are benefiting from TMS but not in complete remission, I want to figure out ways to personalize things for them to bring them all the way home. Because we know from studies in the 1990s that if you leave residual depression and you don't achieve complete remission, then it comes back more frequently. So my goal is helping people get better with TMS and showing you how to do that too. Okay. How to add TMS to your practice. That's really why it works is because you already have a practice. Okay, so we're going to talk about the history of TMS. We're going to talk about how it works. We're going to talk about what it's good for, indications and off-label uses, and risks and adverse side effects. Okay. So history of TMS. The history of TMS starts with the history of the understanding of the relationship between electricity and magnetism. And when you look at electricity and magnetism or you think about them, they're very, very different. Electricity goes through wires. Magnetism goes through everything. Goes through space, basically. Electricity is something that you can use to power things with. Magnetism is something that's used to make electricity. So the two are interchangeable, and Faraday showed that a long time ago. Electricity can be turned into magnetism. Magnetic energy can turn into electric energy. So the idea is that a magnetic field, or a magnet, when encountering a coil, coil being defined as a loop of wires, but in electrical engineering a little bit different, um, when you move a uh, magnet, uh, in the presence of a coil, a current develops. That is, these two wires at the end of this coil, if you hook them up to the right kind of 
light bulb and you had the right number of windings and the right strength of the magnet, you, a, a light would turn on as you move the magnet back and forth. That's actually what Faraday did. He, he was looking to see what did and didn't generate electricity from magnetism. So the idea in TMS is magnetic energy on the outside creates electric current on the inside. So we're not introducing electricity, we're introducing magnetism, but the magnetism induces an electric current because the brain acts like a coil. Let's talk briefly about the machine. So there's different parts of the machine, and I'd like to just break it down with you very quickly so that you have a conceptual understanding of it. So there is the power supply, and the power supply is connected to the wall. Then you have the cooler, which keeps the coil cool. Then you have the pulse shaper. And finally, you have the coil. So voltage is drawn from the wall. Current is drawn from the wall and stored in massive capacitors in the power supply. Energy is acquired. Storing capacitors and then shaped with the pulse circuit shaper and then uh, turned on and then goes through the coil. And when electricity goes through the coil, magnetism goes through the air. That's the transformation of electricity to magnetism. <coughs> okay, mechanism of action. How does this work? Now, one might ask, why do you need to know how this works? Well, Obviously, you all want to know how this works because you have a deep intellectual curiosity and a desire to understand more and gain knowledge. But you're also going to be, and you already have been since you've done TMS, many of you, you're going to be asked by patients. Patients love knowing this. It's almost like you can't just have a declaration, you have to have a narrative. So the narrative used to be, I have depression, it's caused by not enough serotonin in my brain. I go to a doctor, he calls me names, you've got depression, and then gives me a pill, it increases serotonin, and now I feel better. There's a complete story and a loop, and the person feels like they understand it, never mind that it really doesn't work that way. But having a story helps. And so we have to come up with a narrative of how TMS helps depression. And hopefully we will do it with more fidelity to the truth and a solid scientific basis of why we're saying the things we're saying. So I'm going to give you a series of different possibilities for the development of a narrative. And you can take your choice. You can talk about it from a chemical standpoint or a location standpoint or a circuit standpoint. We'll go from the machine to the person. So mechanism of action. We already know that there's magnetic energy coming out of here. We know that it's interacting with the brain. So at that point, what are we looking at? What is happening? After the electrical current is generated in the brain. Well, the first thing we can know that happens includes increased activity in the moment that you are stimulating. That is the definition of stimulation. Stimulation means you apply energy and you increase activity. So if you're increasing activity in an area of the brain and you do it repeatedly, you will have the effect by increasing activity of axonal sprouting. So axons grow new endings and they reconnect with other neurons that they weren't connected with before. And you can think of that in terms of uh, people. People are like axons, and they reconnect with people that they were connected with, but something fell off. You know, many patients who have depression have anxiety, and many patients won't answer the phone, won't return phone calls um, as part of a general reduction in anxiety and social interaction. But the nerve endings, just like people, when stimulated, are more active and that activity leads to a structural change at the level of the cell. Now, these new connections between nerve cells increase brain connectivity to improve function. 
Connectivity is an extremely important new idea in the way we are understanding the brain at this point. The way things connect, when they connect, at what frequencies do they connect or communicate. So connectivity is, is very important and so the energy causes activity, causes regrowth, causes reconnection, causes a more global connectivity. And you see I went from the level of the cellular explanation to the level of the systems explanation. So you can say increased activity, but obviously when things increase in their activity, there's an increase in the release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And brain-derived neurotrophic factor is a, a remarkable biological phenomenon that mirrors beautifully what we see in psychiatry, which is not so much differences in, in quality of mental illness, but differences in severity of mental illness. Severely mentally ill people have more in common with each other than bipolar patients do with each other, or schizophrenic patients do with each other. Severity is really the underlying thing that we are thinking about consciously or unconsciously all the time. We measure severity as a measure of outcome. We use severity as a determining factor whether or not we treat the patient in our office or they should be in an IOP or a locked facility or incarceration. So severity is what determines disposition. And severity and BDNF are this beautiful relationship. The, the more BDNF, the better the mental health and the better the neuronal health. Physical exercise increases BDNF. Is it surprising that it improves most psychiatric conditions? No. We also see in TMS not only increased BDNF, but thicker cortex. That is, you can actually see on brain imaging the cortex, cerebral cortex in that area, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex gets thicker. Now, from my standpoint, it's much more interesting than that. Because if you pay attention to your patients very carefully, and, and you have patients that are long-term patients, and you're treating them for more than TMS, you see them get better in the first month, very much like patients on medications often get better in the first month. There aren't many things in common between medications and TMS, but that's true. But TMS, unlike medications, well, some medications, you see this monthly leap. They get better, and then they're not only better, but they decide to go to school. And then not only do they get better and decide to go to school, but they start a relationship. You see these monthly um, sort of stepwise improvements. And the reason I think that that happens is that if you strengthen one part of the brain, like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, there are processes that are anterograde, whatever the DLPFC is talking to, so if the DLPFC is more active, then whatever it talks to is going to also increase in activity, increase in BDNF, increase in axonal sprouting. And the opposite is true too. Whatever is talking to the DLPFC, because there is transsynaptic communication and changes in the expression of genes at the synapse, the one talking to DLPFC knows whether it's being listened to and will improve also. So whatever we stimulate, there will be a downstream and an upstream effect. I call it enterograde and retrograde regeneration. That is, in a stroke, tissue is damaged and whatever it was talking to starts to die a month later. Whatever it was listening to starts to die a month later. But I think one of the most compelling explanations, which hasn't been fully proven, but we can put it out there, is that when you start to improve and heal and regrow one part of the brain, there results a chain reaction, a chain reaction where DLPFC communicates with and by communicating with helps to regrow. And that chain reaction that keeps going is almost like an anti-aging process. That is, when we regrow one part of the brain, the different parts are connected, and the brain regrows itself in a more and more general and diffuse way. Sorry to go on. Okay, TMS causes increased neurogenesis in the hippocampus. We know this, and neurogenesis and BDNF are very related too. 
talking about how it works. So you can see actually in this slide, you can see very few little black dots. Here there's a lot more as the control had less neurogenesis than the TMS. This is animal data. Other ways to think about it include that there's an induction in electric current which depolarizes neurons in superficial cortex. And we'll talk about depolarization, the angles of the TMS device, the angles of the neuron, and what's called the, um, the triple C cosine uh, hypothesis, which we'll talk about. Uh, transsynaptic changes in brain activity, uh, activation demonstrated the site of stimulation also, oh, cortical and subcortical. So we'll talk about circuits, the fact that the DLPFC is not only a cortical cortical network member, but it also um, is part of a cortical subcortical network, and we'll talk about the basal ganglia and the thalamus briefly. Now, this is one of the prettiest pictures in terms of a sham, one hertz, which is inhibitory, decreasing, red is more, blue is less. And then at 20 hertz, increasing activity. And this is not in the short term, this is long-term potentiation and long-term depression. So the psychiatric conditions that we treat have been found to share certain common substrates, certain anatomical um, patterns. The two structures most related to psychiatric illnesses overall are the anterior cingulate cortex and the anterior insular cortex. And these have to do with awareness of self, awareness of feelings, interoception, anterior insula, but other things too. An anterior cingulate cortex having to do with uh, monitoring, error detection, motivation, several other things. So if you think about the, the, the roles of these structures in general, and you think about the lesion data from strokes in the anterior insula and in the anterior cingulate and what those do to patients, akinetic mutism, or bradycardia. We'll talk about those a little bit more. Um, you can see that if you affect something that affects those, you can help patients to develop a more normal connectivity, which will reduce suffering. So I'm not even sure if people talk about chemical imbalances anymore. Do, do people still hear about this? Do patients say this? I have a chemical imbalance. Do, do any of you say this? <laughs> if, I, if I were to, to lay odds, I'll bet, if I were to ask how many serotonin receptors there are, how many people know? What's the number? Seven? There are seven families, yes. But we know a lot about the psychopharmacology. We've done this for years. We've leaned forward and handed people a little piece of paper and said, here, take this. What we're getting used to now is a completely different way of looking at it. Instead of chemicals, changing network activity and connectivity. So the two most important words there are network and connectivity. Okay. And really the question when we think about how TMS works forces us to think about the relationship between what we know about the brain and what we do in the clinic. And it is tragic that we know so much more about the brain than we apply in the clinic. But this is one of the major advances in that, is we're able to help people with technology that wasn't used before. How do we understand depression? How do we understand the brain? So depression can be thought of as a chemical imbalance. It can be thought of from a psychological viewpoint as a reaction to loss or something like that. It can be thought of as a thing that occurs when you have a certain kind of stroke in the brain. So if you're a neurologist and you see a patient with depression, you could ask the question, does this person have a left frontal lobe stroke? There are many other neurological conditions that cause depression, of course. But it's known that left frontal lobe strokes cause depression. 
You can talk about it through monoamines. There's data that TMS does increase serotonin and dopamine. Circuit function, that's the key thing that we want to focus on. What circuits? Three circuits. There are three circuits that you should feel familiar with and be able to talk about. And those three circuits are the executive circuit, the salient circuit, and the default circuit. So left and right frontal lobes have different responses to a stroke? Well, that's pretty weird. You mean left and right side of the central nervous system have different roles in terms of the neuroanatomical basis of emotional and interoceptive processing? Yes. And this is a slide from Bud Craig. You don't have to know any of this, don't worry. There won't be a quiz. But basically, the information comes in from the peripheral nervous system, and neurologists would be interested in what it does up to about here. But then we are interested. Anterior insula. That's a structure that we should know about. Anterior insula. And the anterior insula has many roles, one of which is interoception. That is, the experience of having a self. The inside of your body, what it feels like, your skin, what it feels like, your, your status. Anterior insula. And it's connected to the anterior cingulate, which has a very different role. It's also connected to DLPFC and OFC, and we're going to talk about these three prefrontal regions. So there's a left-right asymmetry when it comes to the information coming in, that is interoceptive information up to the insula, and the left anterior insula and the right anterior insula are different. How do we know they're different? Well, the first clue that they were different is that a stroke on the right anterior insula, the right insula, I should say, it's not always particularly anterior insula, right insular strokes cause bradycardia, slowing of the heart. Left insular strokes cause tachycardia. And Evidence from Saper and, and others at Harvard looking into the central autonomic nervous system have determined that there are cortical and subcortical structures that actually modulate the autonomic nervous system, increasing and decreasing heart rate, insula being an extremely central, pivotal structure with that. Obviously, if the insula is what you monitor your insides with, it would make sense that part of the insula also controls, and, and we see that with the difference between the left and the right insular strokes. This is the Robinson data um, showing, well, this is the raw data. That is six patients with anterior left frontal lobe stroke, anterior meaning frontal, had depression. One who had posterior left had depression zero in the right hemisphere frontal lobe, one posteriorly. So you see there is a sort of a radial correlation. Many here, fewer here, fewer here, none there. And we're going from left frontal, left posterior, right posterior, right frontal. So there is a neuroanatomic basis for the asymmetry of emotion processing. This is what I was going to talk to you about with the, with the angle of the TMS coil, but let's not do that now. So in terms of the circuits, so when we talk to patients about it, we can say the left side of the brain uh, is necessary for the production and the experience of positive emotions and the right frontal lobe uh, for stressful, I use the word stressful, um, emotions or stressful experiences. Um, and, and in depressed patients, it has been found that there, there's a lower level of brain activity in the left frontal lobe. That is, there's a hypofrontality um, that's more left than right. And when we increase the activity on the left, we increase the mood. The importance of, of this theoretical underpinning um, 
is essential to understand what we'll discuss down the road when we talk about what we do when patients don't get better from the first round of TMS. And, and what do we switch to? Do we switch left and right? Do we switch inhibitory, excitatory? So if increasing left side activity increases positive emotions, it would make sense that an inhibitory stimulus to the right DLPFC will reduce negative emotions. And those are related ideas, but they're not the same ideas. That is, increasing positive will have an effect to reduce negative and vice versa. But they're different things. Increasing positive and reducing negative are different things. Any questions so far? Really? No questions. Okay. Um, forgive me, I'm a stupid neurologist. But, uh, okay, so somebody that has a non-dominant infarct we see extreme hemi-neglect, we see kind of a happy-go-lucky thing, uh, nothing happens to them, et cetera. How does that correlate and how do you, tr is there a possibility of treating that? Because that's almost an impossible thing to treat on a, from a clinical standpoint. Right, so, so the question was, um, if you get a uh, non-dominant stroke, you can often see uh, Left-sided neglect, which is that the person doesn't dress themselves on the left, doesn't eat anything off their plate on the left side. That side of the universe doesn't exist to them, left neglect. And, and then the other thing you see is um, uh, the belle indifférence, like they say in, in MS, where they, do, they don't really know that there's something really wrong with them. I mean, you'd, you'd think that they'd be concerned about this, that they're paralyzed on half of their body, and they're not, which is, which is very interesting, and, and it's an obvious thing that would make you not want to have the explanation of why depression happened. See, before Robinson and Sharkstein, the explanation for why patients with stroke got depressed was, well, if you were paralyzed on half your body, you'd be depressed too. That's not a good explanation, because the people who were, had an exactly equivalent paralysis on the other side are not depressed. They're not even concerned. It's, it's strange. So I think that raises one of, the, one of the interesting topics of what's the opposite of happiness? What's the opposite of depression? So if left frontal lobe strokes cause depression and right-sided strokes cause apathy, indifference, unawareness of the problem, that's kind of interesting. I mean, that's an interesting this versus that. So awareness um, of self, which is related obviously to the practical idea of awareness of one side of the universe, awareness neglect, awareness um, insight into their condition, um, they're probably related. But like we'll see, there's a, there's a complex coalescence of different circuits. So the, the, the circuits that we're talking about um, can, be, can be impaired at any one of the locations of the circuit, so it could be basal ganglia that could cause the same thing, including paralysis, including there's neglect that's been reported from basal ganglia strokes. So what was the question again? Well, again, it, it, you're... Could we help them with this? Yes. Oh, yes. So that takes us into the topic of how to help people with strokes, which in general I'm going to let Elahi talk about down the road. but. Strokes are one of the most exciting applications of TMS because in a stroke you have this area that gets lesioned and then a ring around it of perfectly alive, healthy tissue in the next month will die. And that's part of what I discussed a moment ago about anterograde and retrograde degeneration. It's called the penumbra of the stroke. So a person gets a certain amount of deficit and then a month later there's this worse deficit. And stimulating that area around the stroke can keep it alive. And we know that neuroplasticity permits the reshaping, the remodeling, the rearchitecture so that you can gain function back. So that's one thing. Keep tissue alive. From my standpoint, TMS is useful for. Especially machines that allow you to do location-specific stimulations and inhibitions. Uh, so inhibitory stimulation is the other thing in my experience experience about stroke that's extremely exciting. And that is, if a person is paralyzed on the left side, probably may mean that uh, the cortex on 
the other side, the contralateral side, has been injured. So left-sided paralysis, right cortical injury, right? It, the, the injury that causes neglect is actually a little bit posterior to that. It's uh, parietal, the equivalent of Gerstmann syndrome. But um, um, in a person with paralysis on the left and no activity on the right, there is this associated hyperactivity on the contralateral side. But the hyperactivity on the contralateral side isn't moving the other limb. It's inhibiting this side. So you've got this double whammy. You lose tissue over here, number one, paralysis. And then the, uh, to compound the problem, add insult to injury, the, the other side is sending more inhibitory signals to the already paralyzed arm. So for patients who have partial movement and who are in rehabilitation trying to move forward, it's extremely helpful to inhibit the inhibiting healthy side. And you can do them both in the same session, you can do them in separate sessions. In, in, in the ideal setting, it would be done at the same time of or in close proximity to physical therapy and rehabilitation so that the muscles that a person needs to move can get some practice moving and avoid disuse atrophy and neuronal death. And the activity and the stimulation can go together. So does that answer the question better? Yes. Circuits. So before we talk about circuits, let's talk about loops. Loops are circuits, but they were described a long time before. 1984, Alexander wrote a paper about cortical, subcortical circuits. And, and the, the, the loop, I'm going to call them loop instead of circuit, because circuit I'll use to refer to something else. The loop basically goes from cortex. Where's cortex? Oh, it's all cortex. So that's all cortex. And it comes down to part of the basal ganglia called the caudate and putamen. And that's the striatal part of the basal ganglia. That's the first part, cortex to basal ganglia. The second is basal ganglia to the pallidum, the globus pallidus, subthalamic nucleus. There's two parts of the globus pallidus and there's two parts of the circuit, but we're just gonna talk about cortical, subcortical. Cortical, basal ganglia, and then basal ganglia sends its output to the thalamus. And the thalamus is the major input relay station that basically guards the cortex. It filters, processes, prepares sensory information for the cortex. It's not that simple, but in general, that's what it does. Cortex, basal ganglia, thalamus, cortex. Cortex, basal ganglia, thalamus, cortex. And there's an excitatory and an inhibitory part, and information flows in these loops. And the loops are actually not circular loops. The loops are spirally loops. So the limbic system will send projections down through the basal ganglia, up through the thalamus, and up to the cortex, but also the thalamic output will also go to some other parts of the cortex, like thinking. And similarly, the thinking output will go to motor. So you have this spiraling loop that starts with affect and ends in action. These cortical, subcortical loops. And, it, and this is an extremely helpful way to look at why we have depression and why TMS works, um, because it's true. And the other part of the truth is, so that's the simple way to understand it. Cortex, basal ganglia, thalamus, cortex. There's two different parts of basal ganglia, but that doesn't, that's not relevant for the psychiatrist. Default, salience, and executive. These are the networks. So the reason I talked about the loops is that these networks are connected to themselves through the subcortical structures, but they're also connected to each other through those loops. So let's talk about the default mode network first. How much time do I have? Joe? We don't know. 
I apologize for being late, by no the way. Um, no okay, so but finish what you need to I'll finish this, this set of slides, and then we can talk more in, in a little while. So the default mode network. Now, the default mode network was actually discovered by somebody uh, in Milwaukee who wrote a paper, and everybody didn't notice it. But then, a couple years later, in St. Louis, Marcus Rachel and his group were doing studies with PET scanners looking at brain activity during certain tasks. So they would have mathematical tasks and they would have verbal tasks. And somebody noticed that in between, the brain wasn't quiet. In fact, there was as much activity going on when the patient wasn't doing something as there was when they were doing something. It was in different locations, but there was brain activity when the patient was sitting there and had no permission to think or use their brain. They were just supposed to sit there, but their brain's still going. What's happening? Well, from an a, a intuitive perspective, their mind is wandering. Mind wandering turns out to be an important idea because it's related to cognitive control. Now, this activity occurring at rest came to be known as the default mode network because there's a series of structures that consistently light up. And subsequent research has shown that the connectivity of those structures and other structures changes in depression. The most, the most clear example is the study by Fang et al. that looked at patients who were treated for depression and found that the, pat the patients who got better had a shift in their resting network connectivity from midline structures associated with the self, awareness of the self, control of the self, uh, self-narrative, um, self-understanding, a shift to lateral structures, that is, other people, places, and things. And the idea that the connectivity of the brain would go from focus on self to a balanced focus on other people too would warm the hearts of some psychodynamic psychotherapists because the, the rumination that occurs in depression is almost always self-rumination. And Beck de de described the negative cognitive triad of negative view of the universe, the future, and the self. That is, it's not just a negative view of the self, but it's a, a recurrent and unpleasant view of the self. So that when the connectivity changes, well, we don't know which comes first or if there's any causal relation, but there's a change in connectivity in the default mode network in depressed people who get better, and that change is that there's less self-focus. Default mode network. Now, the default mode network has emerged as an extremely important topic for other reasons in understanding the brain because the resting connectivity of the different networks can be measured, and, and the default mode network um, uh, is, is what the brain does when we, we go to mind wandering. I, 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 think, I think the idea that mind wandering is our default is, is truly a misunderstanding. Um, but hopefully it won't have a bad impact thinking that the default is mind wandering. Because mind wandering has a certain toxicity as well as creativity. But there's the default mode network. Then there's the salience network. And the salience network should be very familiar to us. Salience meaning importance or worthiness of notice. Importance and worthiness of notice has to do with reward. It's not exactly the same as the reward system, but looking at 800 different articles that talked about uh, salience and reward, in some sense, in most senses, they're the same thing. That is, the salience network has to do with the anticipation of reward, looking for reward, experiencing a deficit of reward. So it's important with obsessive compulsive disorder, with uh, substance use. Um, salience network is very important. Overactivity of the salience network can be found in, in anxiety. Uh, and the salience network and the associated structures are the substrates of the changes that occur in depression, I mean, in addiction, like in the nucleus accumbens, that are permanent. That is, permanent changes due to a reward disorder like addiction. The last is executive. I have a bunch of slides on that. I did not. <laughs>
Okay. Executive. And, and the executive is related to the attention network. They're a little bit more different, but they're kind of the same thing. The executive system is more of a directed, goal-oriented, um, attentional, and sequencing, and working memory, and some people would say self-inhibition, uh, control. It certainly has to do with um, delayed gratification, delayed discounting. And the executive circuit is what we stimulate when we stimulate DLPFC. So the DLPFC could be thought of as the hub of the executive network. And it connects with certain other structures. And when we improve DLPFC function, we improve executive function. And executive function is one of the most important predictors of quality of life. It's not surprising. If you don't have delayed gratification, if you don't have self-control, if you can't sequence things or hold them in memory, it'd be hard to accomplish much or function very well. Executive system, executive function is very important. There isn't a perfect relationship, but it, in general, we stimulate DLPFC, we improve executive function, although there isn't a lot of data to support that yet, but how many, how many clinicians here who've done TMS on patients have noticed improvement in executive function? Raise your hands. Yeah, yeah. And that has an enormous impact on their whole life and the life of the family around them. Because a person that can't decide to go to the bank before they go to the post office um, can't have a relationship either. I mean, the ability to attend, to connect, relies on working memory, relies on self-control, inhibition, inhibitory processes. So executive function is, in, in my way of telling it, executive function is, is the central concept, the executive function and the executive circuit, the central concept in the narrative that I give to patients and their parents when thinking about doing, doing TMS. Because for a parent, there's no greater gift, well, beyond love. Love is good. But executive function is really important with functioning. And, and many times when parents are concerned about kids, it's because they notice deficits in executive function that concern them. Um, the ability to give a person better executive function is kind of a miracle. And it's something that we can get passionate about, excited about, and tell a narrative about. And insofar as that's true, there are some implications like attention deficit disorder, and like normal people performing in athletic or other competitive fields, there's implications of executive function that go beyond depression. So the idea of circuits, large scale neurocognitive networks, and distributing processing for attention, language, and memory, arose from the Boston group of behavioral neurologists one of whose leaders is uh, Masulam. And he described this at, way back in 1990. It didn't really take off until the last 10 or 15 years. The most useful review slash opinion that you can read in my opinion um, that helps inform you about the narrative of TMS to brain circuits that are malfunctioning to brain circuits that are functioning better is this uh, article from Williams in 2016. And she shows six net networks. That's one of the confusing things about learning about circuits and networks in brain science is that there isn't quite an agreed upon number, although there are many recurrent themes. So she uses four different networks, uh, including default mode network, salience network like we talked about, but then also um, negative affect. So going back to the um, tryptophan depletion studies, there's been evidence that when patients feel sad, there are certain areas of the brain that light up, including um, subgenual cortex, et cetera. Positive affect, there's areas of the brain that are more related to positive affect. And there's something wrong with her diagram insofar as it's symmetrical. I'm not sure what, what she is referring to. But then there's the attention and the cognitive control. And so executive function, cognitive control, and attention are all related, but not exactly the same thing. And you can differentiate between attention and cognitive control. And there are different structures that are involved. But DLPFC is right there. 
And cognitive control, the central hub is DLPFC. Improving it improves cognitive control, which is obviously related to executive function. And there are those who are now starting to understand psychiatric conditions all in terms of cognitive control. And if you think about OCD, uh, cognitive control is obviously an issue. If you think about depression, the ability to shift, the ability to control your thoughts, the ability to go from mind wandering to purposeful activity. Clearly there's something going on in cognitive control with depressed patients. And anxiety patients? Yes. Cognitive control underlies a lot of different things. Um, and by stimulating DLPFC and strengthening it, we probably are not just treating depression, but we're probably preventing depression in the future. And if you ask me, which you didn't, but I'm going to pretend like you did. If you ask me, it's going to be the future of dementia treatment. I think if we stimulate a person at age 16 or 18 or 20 or 40 or 60 for depression, how could they not have a reduced likelihood of dementia? And if you treat patients between age 50 and 80, what you see often is patients come in for depression, but there's some hint of dementia, and you don't know how much is going to go away until the depression goes away. But you do TMS, they get better in both departments, depression and cognition. What did you just treat? Did you treat the depression and the depression helped the cognition? That would be a simplification. It's true. And that there are some people with absolutely no dementia who are 60 or 80 years old who have just depression, they, they get better and, and, and their cognition gets better. But the two are related. And my hunch is that the people we do TMS with today will not get or will have a lower incidence of dementia tomorrow. So at some point I should have talked about the different parts of the prefrontal cortex. In case anybody asks you what the difference between prefrontal and frontal is, anybody know? Raise your hand. $100 reward if you know the difference. $1,000 reward. I didn't think so. I've actually never met anybody that knew this because it took me a long time to find out. What? Um, it's going to be the different, difference in the, the cytoarchitecture. Yes? Cells. Yes, what's the difference? Oh, you're close. Getting closer. No, you're getting farther away. <laughs> getting farther away. No, but the difference between the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex was defined in 1948 by Woolsey et al. at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and they defined it as the part of the frontal lobe, the part of the frontal lobe that is association cortex receiving its thalamic input. Remember, we talked about these loops. Receiving its thalamic input from the mediodorsal nucleus of the thalamus. So the part of your frontal lobe that is motor and supplementary motor and frontal eye fields, these part, parts get their thalamic input from the lateral nuclei of the thalamus. But the association cortex in front of it gets its input from the mediodorsal. So prefrontal cortex means it gets its input from the mediodorsal. And it does have a different cytoarchitecture because it's association cortex as opposed to more input or output. The input-output cortex have a tendency to have cytoarchitecture emphasizing layers four and five, basically. Um, but the association cortices have more cytoarchitecture thickness in areas two and three. This is obviously a simplification, but two and three are the cortical-cortical associations in one hemisphere and across the hemispheres. So when we talk about prefrontal cortex, these are the three parts you can think of. And um, I'm basing this on uh, articles from the neurological literature that talk about three kinds of frontal lobe strokes. And the three kinds are the akinetic mutism that results when you have a stroke in the anterior cingulate cortex. Akinetic mutism means not moving, not talking. From a psychiatric standpoint, it looks very much like depression. There's no motivation. There's apathy. They're asocial. Um, so anterior cingulate cortex, if you think from the opposite of the lesion, you would think it has to do with motivation, and it probably does. Motivation, focus, it's part of the reward circuit also. 
Orbitofrontal cortex. So anterior cingulate is right in the midline. Orbitofrontal cortex is kind of right above your eyes, kind of a cortex parallel to the ground. One could think of it like this. And this is going to be important later when we talk about different sites. Orbitofrontal cortex is, is peculiarly connected to the sensory cortices. So all of the sensory cortices, um, including, I think, olfaction, although it doesn't go through the thalamus. But orbitofrontal cortex has a lot of sensory information coming into it. And it's peculiar if you think about orbitofrontal cortex as what we've come to understand with it. When you have a stroke there, you get a disinhibition syndrome like Phineas Gage, a person who can't hold back, a person who's impulsive, a person who's more likely to use drugs and alcohol, which Phineas did. And if you have excess activity in the OFC, you have a syndrome of hyperactive, anxious, ruminative, uh, very active, uh, punitive superego, somebody might say. And what the relationship between those and sensory cortices it seems peculiar at first. But if you look at the different parts of the orbitofrontal cortex, you see that the anterior part has to do with that social brain. The posterior, very, very primitive part of the orbitofrontal cortex has to do with choosing what you're going to eat. Good food, bad food. And that's probably one of the reasons why it's so close to the olfactory bulbs is that much of the early mammals' decision-making about good food, bad food, eat it, don't eat it, um, probably involved smelling something. And it's very interesting, the two parts of the brain being connected, socially appropriate, inappropriate, food appropriate, inappropriate. So you can see the, the, the correspondence, the, the way that it evolved from food choice to social choice. And if you think about it, when you think about judgmental social comments, they often have to do with digestion. Did you hear what she did to him? It was disgusting. Right? Or, oh, it makes me want to puke when I think about what she said to her. There's this visceral gastrointestinal overlay to social judgments. It's very interesting. OFC. And that'll be, that'll be a topic we will talk about when when we get to alternating alternative sites of stimulation for addiction and obsessive compulsive control. But most of the time we're not stimulating those two, we're stimulating this. I just put up this slide so that you've got a, a clear triangular understanding of the prefrontal cortex. It's not one thing, um, they don't all do the same thing, they have completely different effects when a person has a stroke there. So. Um, what happens when you have a stroke in DLPFC? Non-neurologist first. Anybody know? Neurologist, chime in. Executive function impairment. Dis-executive syndrome. Working memory impairment, sequencing impairment. Sorry, I didn't give you more time to think and answer. You can interrupt me anytime I want, you want. But if a stroke to DLPFC causes a dis-executive syndrome, that's further evidence that when we stimulate it, it may enhance executive function. So this is the Rolandic fissure. So there's the parietal of the frontal lobe. We call all of this the frontal lobe. But this part of the frontal lobe is a little bit different than this part of the frontal lobe. In particular, you've got the motor strip right there. And then you've got area six, the supplementary motor cortex, which actually um, has kind of two different areas and functions. One is midline having to do with free will, initiation of action and feeling of agency, and one laterally having to do with sequential mo motor movements. So if you get a stroke in the primary cortex, why do I do the wrong way? If you get a stroke in the primary cortex, you'll have a paralysis, but if you have a stroke in the, if you have a stroke in the so you have paralysis, muscle won't move. But if you have a stroke in area six, the supplementary motor cortex, you have a, a deficit in a sequence. That is, the muscles still move, but you can't tie a tie or brush your teeth or get dressed. It's called apraxia. So direct motor movements, secondary sequences of motor movements, and then frontal eye field. Now only part of it is frontal and the other part is prefrontal. It's very interesting and complicated, the frontal eye field. People generally think of frontal eye field as movement of the eyes. 
Why would an enormous amount of cortex be devoted to movement of the eyes? You'd think that that would be a pretty, pretty simple thing, moving the eyes. Why would you have to have a whole bunch of cortex to moving the eyes? Why not putting it in the motor strip? Move the eyes with the motor strip. That's where everything else gets moved. No, large thing called frontal eye fields. And the frontal eye fields are very interesting for several reasons to some people, not to most. Um, it, there are saccadic deficits in schizophrenia. There's frontal eye field uh, relationships with eye movements in schizophrenia that are deficient. And there's some thought that the more abstract conceptualization of the function of the frontal eye fields, Brodmann's area eight, has to do with the way we understand the relationship of an object to its context, which may sound like a lot like gestalt therapy. The object and the field, the, the, the thing you're looking at in the context in which it occurs. What your mom did and what was the context in which your mom did it. So you can see how complex that relationship might be and why the frontal eye fields might be doing a lot more than simply the movement of eyes because you have to go back and forth between a thing and its context or uh, memory and its meaning. Frontal eye fields. Incidentally, I think it's the stimulation of the frontal eye fields that led to therapeutic improvement in patients who were stimulated with Neurostar TMS systems. Patients who are stimulated with Neurostar TMS systems were stimulated approximately a centimeter and a half posterior to the anterior inferior DLPFC. Where is that? As far as I can tell, that's Brodmann's area eight frontal eye fields. So what does that mean? They got better anyway. How can you get better if you stimulate in the wrong place? Two answers. First of all, right place, wrong place. Stimulating the frontal eye fields might be very beneficial to patients. Um, and second of all, there's a general effect when the brain starts to get more healthy, BDNF goes up and that affects the areas around it. So there's a specific effect where you stimulate and there's a general effect on the brain as a whole. Brobman's area eight, the frontal eye fields. And then there's a prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is the anterior cingulate, the orbitofrontal, and the DLPFC.